So uh, we're in the last part of Peter. Um, look forward to the day of the Lord. Um, it's very difficult to do a picture uh, about that subject um, other than it's a new day. Uh, so I thought, why not show a new day of the sun rising? Uh, look forward to the day of the Lord. Um, but actually in very difficult circumstances that the Bible is asking us to do, to look forward, to be excited, uh, as it were, in circumstances that seem terrible. Um, and this is, this is where it's, it is, as, as it has been with Peter, in this, certainly this part, this book of Peter, has been very real uh, as we've been going through it. Um, and so today we kind of look at part two of the day of the Lord. And last week we needed to understand that there will be, and are people, uh, false teachers who will scoff at the idea that Jesus will be coming back. Uh, it was designed, uh, as Peter talks about previously, to give a pass to sin and tell people that since the earth has been going along, as it always has been, then it just will continue to do so. It won't matter. Uh, you can do whatever you like. Uh, and, and in that sense, why not do whatever you want? Because, um, you know, we're, we're, we're but a blip in the time of God. Uh, but we seem to want to send, make us the centre of the universe. And so if it hasn't happened in our lifetime, uh, we think, well, it can't be happening at all because I'm so important uh, that why would God do it any other time? Um, and so there's this idea that if it hasn't happened, then he won't do it at all. But then Peter rejected that idea, not just in principle, but he laid down evidence to show God setting out what he was going to do and then proving through scriptures uh, that reflect our witness accounts that he did actually deliver on that promise of Jesus. And so says on that basis, he will do it again. Uh, we've had lots of promises from politicians, as you can, uh, you've can, you heard a lot. Um, whether any of those politicians will deliver on those promises is another thing. Uh, the difference here is that God has proven that every promise he's made, he's always delivered on. And so he says, I will then deliver on the future promise of Jesus's return. And so this week, Peter turns to those same people who are, who are being led away or trying to be led away by false teaching and says, since Jesus' return is true uh, as going by God's past form, then how should we live? How should we live as Christians? What does it mean? Uh, and what should we do in these, what appears to be terrible times? Uh, what we will learn as time continues towards this inevitability of Christ's return is that we should then live holy and godly lives in anticipation of that event. And the reason is because if we do not continue to trust God in what he has promised, we will be drawn away by error and lawlessness. And so not be ready uh, when Jesus returns to judge the world. So let's continue in 2 Peter 3, and we'll start with verse 10. Uh, and it says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. What Peter starts with is this idea that one day, and I, I, meant, I think I, I spoke about it last week because Peter talked about it a couple of times also in the previous verses, but says it again here. What he starts with is the idea that one day life on earth will be here at one time, and then it will be gone the next. And we'll get to that, how, we, how do we see that it's just in a, almost in a moment that that will happen. And so to describe this, Peter uses this example of a thief, and he says, uh, it will just come. It will just come like you've never expected. And I thought, yeah, because what good is a thief that phones you up and says, uh, be ready, I'm coming to your house to take all your things away from you. Um, I'm coming about 10 o'clock, uh, so be there. What a terrible thief that would be. Uh, and I'm not saying for any second that Jesus or God himself, God, Jesus Christ, is a thief in that sense, but like a thief in, the, in that way. Uh, it did remind me, though, there was a film, and I, I seem to be quoting more films more recently, but it just suddenly popped into my head. There was a film back in 1991, uh, and it was called L.A. Story, and it had Steve Martin in it, and he was the lead character. Uh, and there's this scene where he, it's a, it is a weird film, but it's quite a deep film towards the end. But there's this scene where his character is in a queue for a ca in a cash machine, cash machine queue, an ATM, as the Americans call it, an ATM. And as people draw out money and walk away from the cash machine, there's a queue, another queue of robbers 
are queuing up. And so there's a robber assigned to each person who then goes and draws out money from the cash machine. Uh, and as, the, as people draw out money and walk away from the cash machine, there's, this ro there's these robbers and they're waiting to take money from each person as they draw money from the cash machine. And, and the idea really in that particular regard is that it's so normal in LA that it's just now reciprocal. Like they just say, give me the money and they give it to them. It's just a, a normal way of life in LA apparently. Almost that it's expected to be robbed there. And so he draws out the money from the cash machine and the next robber approaches him and says, hi, my name is Bob and I'll be your robber today. Uh, and, and just as expected, he says, hi, and he hands over the money. And it, this just keeps going on and on behind like in the scene. People just hand over and the robber introduces themselves and they hand over the money. Just to be clear, this is exactly opposite to what God will do. Uh, there's, a, there's a sense of obviously that's just happening and we should all expect it. But Peter describes in the sense of the second coming, Jesus returning, as the opposite, you will not know the day or the hour. And even Jesus says this himself, right? He says, only the Father knows when he is going to return. Jesus himself, and we can get into the debate about Jesus also being God, and how does he not know the day returns if he's also God? That's a different thing. But he doesn't know because the Father knows, and he'll, he'll send Jesus at the time the Father knows is right. But it will be, as Peter says, unexpected. And so... What we find here, Matthew 24, 42 to 44, it says, therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. Uh, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect. And so what will this, I suppose, what will this burning up look like? We've seen that Jesus will come at a day that he chooses or that God the Father chooses and God the Son will appear. But then what does the burning up look like? Because we've, we've all looked at Revelation and some of it's imagery and some of it's real, some of it's stuff that will happen and some of it's imagery for the sake of trying to describe what God will do. So what does the burning up look like when, when Peter's so extreme in his language and he says, the earth will be destroyed? Everything in it will be destroyed. And it's true to say that the, the planet itself, looking at the verses, it's, it's not a replacement. So the, the planet is not going to be obliterated. We know that because the, the language is that life will be stripped from the earth, in effect. That's what he means by the uh, earth and the heavens. Heavens is the sky. Earth is the planet, is the layer over the planet. And so he says, God will clear all that because what's happened is man has infected it with sin. He's basically broken it. And so everything acts as man wants it to act in a certain way, to a certain degree that God has allowed. And so now it's kind of crooked. It's all broken and it doesn't quite work right. So rather than desolate, he, he's, he's going to strip the planet as it were. Now, all the planet, the living thing, as well as the sky. But it, intention is to wipe the brokenness that we have put on the earth. And so he then goes on in verse 11 to 13. Uh, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. Look, uh, as you look forward to the day of God and speed and the speed it's coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness and so again we've got this very extreme language that peter is using to describe and, and that how do you he says look forward to the day that this is coming and the day that's coming is a day of judgment a day of fire a day that the ungodly will be judged all will be judged but the ungodly will be sent to hell and, and that's something we should all fear as christians in terms of wanting to see as God wants to see many more come to him. But whatever the day the Lord is coming, it will be for the purpose of making way for a new heaven and a new earth. But why does the environment have to be burned up? Um, don't we always say, and doesn't the Bible say, that people are the problem? Why does the earth have to suffer for what we have done to it? Uh, in our sins what why is it why can't people just be judged and why can't 
uh, as I, I may not talk in this particular sermon, but in private to you, uh, that the earth will not transition, as I've debated with someone recently, into a nice, fluffy, uh, rosy time. It, there'll be an in-between time where the earth will be burned, where God has to cleanse the earth, and we have to be real about that. But why not deal with just the sin problem of people? Well, we are the problem, that's true, but we also are the ones who have broken it. We've broken creation through what we've done. Uh, We are the ones putting it under duress, under stress, uh, due to our sinful nature of of which we take out on each other and on the earth itself. Uh, I've probably mentioned this before. There's uh, there's an, an, say this, a new idea in farming, uh, which is regenerative farming, which is actually biblical. Uh, it's actually a biblical way of managing farmland in that you have parts of your farmland that you give rest to, you let wild grow, and then you move to a different field and, and work on that. And then the next season, you move back to the other field and let the other one recover. And then I, I do love this about the world. And they say, oh, we've got this great new technique called regenerative farming. Uh, But it is from the Bible. It literally is from the Bible. Uh, And you can go and read that in there. But what we've done is we've so abused it that it's under this pressure, under this strain. And we see this in Romans 8, uh, 20 to 23. And it says, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice. It wasn't creation's fault, as in not, uh, not including us, but the rest of creation. But by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Uh, We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies." The Bible says the earth groans under the pain of our sin that we committed against God when we disobeyed him. In response to our sin, God has had to curse all of creation in response to what we had done. And you might ask, well, why then did God just, maybe God could just choose not to do that. We have to go back to justice. If God is a truly righteous, perfect God in justice, there has to be consequence for disobedience. There has to be a price paid for the disobedience. And in this context, most certainly, a consequence of what we did uh, in our disobedience was that the earth then suffered uh, because of us. And so we see that then in this verse that as creation grows, grown, so those who put their trust in Jesus await the day with, his, with anticip, anticipation for his re- return. Let me, un- let me try and p- unpack that a little bit, what that means. If you're a believer in Christ and you love God's creation, uh, and we don't do very well with it, but you still love God's creation because you've finally understood, as we all have, God created everything. And the love, the love that you have is not the love for the for the soil, is not the love for the physical thing, it's for the love of the creator that created it in the first place. And by that, you love what he creates. We love what he creates. And so then in our realization, we anticipate then the return of Jesus because we want all things made right in his judgment. And so we look forward to that day, as Peter also says, because we want things to be made right. We want Jesus to come and to judge the world and we pray and hope that we we put our trust in him and that he will bring us into his kingdom. But the reason why we look forward to it is because now we want, we want creation to be as it was before the fall. We want the repair work as it were, although it's not repair, but let's say repair work to happen because there's a greater kingdom coming. There is a time where there'll be no pain and no fear that no one will have to worry about those things anymore and God will make everything new. So our anticipation is that we want to see God do that work. And so we groan currently under this weight of the consequences of a fallen, broken world that is in sin. And so Peter says, 
So you then must live holy and godly lives, looking forward to that day of a new heaven and a new earth. And why is that? Because we will be adopted, he says, into sonship. Our bodies will be redeemed. And, and I, I look at this and I think it's like, I think it's like Peter telling, telling us that if you're a believer in Jesus and trust everything that God has done, everything that he's said and everything that he has written down, as well as already witnessed, then our attitude and outlook as you allow the Holy Spirit to work in you will have this future view while living in the present time. So what people do is, without Jesus, let, let me tell you, and, and this is, I'm generalizing, but I can only think because I, I think about my own time before I became a Christian, and I think in desperation, in times of desperation, who is there to cling to? And I've said this before, who is there to cling to when you're not a believer? And what happens is people, people do get drawn into the present moment of suffering, which I can totally understand. I totally understand that. You, you get drawn into that suffering and it almost feels like a spiral. But Peter here says, but keep looking heavenward because the day's coming when all things will be made right. But in the meantime, you have the Holy Spirit who you know you can trust, who you said you believe in, and he will give you the confidence. He will give you the strength you need to keep living in the present time, readying yourself for the future time. Somehow, through the terrible time this earth is heading for, and as that same brokenness affects our lives today, we will need to keep our eyes on the prize, the future hope and glory of Jesus Christ and his return. Uh, Luke 21, verse 34 to 36 says, Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and anxieties of life, and that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen, and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Living holy and godly lives, what, is, what does that look like? Let me tell you what it's not. It's not that you do good things and look good to other people. It is that you trust in Jesus because Jesus himself, and when Peter says this, this is what he has in mind because this is when, whenever they say it, whenever any part of the New Testament, most especially so, speaks about being holy and godly, there's an assumption being made by those writers. Hope being holy and godly is not you being holy and godly in yourself. It is because Jesus Christ is already holy and godly and you place your trust in him and so you are holy and godly. Does that make sense? You cannot be holy and godly. Peter is not asking for a performance. He's not asking for you to be very good and look good and start appearing like you've done everything well check all the boxes, he's saying, no, as a believer in Christ, you will be holy and godly because of Jesus Christ, because you place your trust in him. It is not your work that matters, it is the work of Christ that matters. It is Jesus himself and the act of his sacrifice, his death and resurrection, that makes us holy. But of course, we must avoid those things that dishonor God. It doesn't mean it's a license. We've said this before. We must seek to do good. Oh, sorry, to do good. But this good must not come from a religious checklist. God doesn't want our good works if those good works are ultimately about how good we are. If I'm trying to show off to God, that's not good works. That's just me trying to look good in front of God. And let me tell you, God will have none of it. Because Jesus needs to occupy that space. He needs to be the king of the universe. He is the king of the universe. But he needs to be the king of the universe in each of our lives also. So this won't work if we're doing it out of the basis of, uh, of how good we think we are. So here's what I think Peter and many others have said in the Bible. God wants an honest open heart, a broken and contrite spirit. And I think far too often we have overcomplicated this. We give the impression that people have got to do A, B, and C in order to be allowed 
to call themselves a Christian. Literally, the only thing people need to do is to admit their sinfulness, which is repent, admit Jesus is king, and that he died for their sins, and you're saved. Matthew 19, 16 to 26. Uh, now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good things must I do to get eternal life? I love this story, by the way. I think I've quoted it so many times, but I absolutely love it because it is definitely uh, the go-to story, the go-to account of, uh, of, what ha- of, of a good example of a checklist. Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, if you want, sorry, if you want to enter life, obey the commandments. We, uh, sorry, I've lost that there. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones, the man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony on your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I've kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? I'd, I'd like to have met this guy. Uh, 21. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. It is a great verse to understand that doing the right thing is not enough to be saved that what Jesus spoke to then and I'm sure he knew this when he was telling him all the commandments that he must fulfill what Jesus knew about this man was that he most definitely had idolized his wealth and so he says to him if you want to be perfect bearing in mind that he just said no one's perfect and no one is good except God no one is perfect except God. He says, do this. And the reason why he says that in particular is not that actually by doing that, it will actually make him perfect. Not in my view. He knows he's not going to do that. And so he calls him out on where his idol is. And he says, you may have done all the things that I asked you to do in the law, but clearly you've not allowed the law to reveal the sin in your heart. And by speaking into the wealth Jesus says, I'm speaking into the sin that you have, the idol you have in your heart right now. Unless we have genuinely submitted our heart, our mind, our body and soul to God, then all the good and law-keeping mean nothing. And why is that? Because to even contemplate that you have met the requirements of a good and perfect God in itself is prideful, and boastful of self. Even to say any of the laws that I have met is in itself prideful, is in itself self-boastful. You see how God gets us there? He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's written down. It's absolutely cast iron. But worse still, it means that if all of that was possible for us to do in our own strength, then Jesus died for nothing. And the rejection of Jesus' salvation is a rejection of salvation itself. This is a very carefully laid trap by the enemy. And so we're warned in so many passages that I probably will quote during this sermon, mostly about traps. Peter even warns himself, be aware, be on alert. And then he continues, uh, verse 14 to 16. 2 Peter 3, 14 to 16. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote with also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their destruction remember 
the one who is found spot, spotless and blameless is the one who is a believer in the one who is spotless and blameless. Believers are spotless and blameless because Jesus is spotless and blameless. Without him, we are not, no matter how hard we try to be. And so by definition of being a believer in Christ, you and I will be found spotless and blameless because he is that. Uh, just a couple of verses, Colossians 1, but now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Uh, Ephesians 1, 4, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love. But then what's the rest of this about? Why does Peter then go off on this, what could be conceived as a strange tangent, almost, of talking about Paul? He, he speaks of Paul in his writings very highly. He says that there are some things that are hard to understand. I mean, that's an understatement. If you've ever read any of Paul's writings, I mean, reading Romans alone, well, uh, if you don't take it carefully, it could send you a little bit do lally. I mean, you have to be careful. But let me be clear, the writings are perfect because they're penned by God, as it were, through the Holy Spirit. It's just our minds a struggle, struggle with what he says because he's, he delves into deep things about who God is and his amazing grace and his son, Jesus Christ. He says that ignorant and unstable people distort those words to their own destruction. Bear in mind, and I think, I think this is where it comes from. This is written after Paul rebuked Peter for separating himself from the Gentiles and eating only with the Orthodox Jews. Uh, so roughly, there's about a 20-year gap between the, the writing in Galatians and the writing here in 2 Peter. So it's pretty fresh. I mean, 20 years is a long time, but it's still pretty fresh, I would say. Uh, and I think this is what drives Peter. This is why it's so passionate in the writing. And, and Paul, in that time, in Galatians, which I'll read, he, he rebukes it. And because Peter was basically scared of what the author, Orthodox Jews would think of him. So he went back to the customs of eating separate from the Gentiles. And so it's a good point to look at just briefly into Galatians. And we'll look at the whole section because it's really uh, important, I think. When Peter came to Antioch, I posed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belong to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, that's a big accusation, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by obser observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I've been crucified with Christ and I, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. When you go back to see what Peter said about Paul, you start getting the idea why he says that. I mean, this is a crucial moment for Peter, just to give some context here of what we've been going through with Peter here. This must have been a, a life-defining moment. And by the way, Paul stands up in front of everybody and, and reels off this just utter godly righteousness about what it means to be a believer in Christ. And some of the things he says there does come out in Peter in some form or another. You can see in his writing 
that there's something that has hung with him for that whole time. And certainly when he talks about misleading Barnabas, my goodness, it's almost like he's, he's speaking from experience about the false teachers and saying, this is what they do. Maybe he says, this is what I did when I was misleading others, when I started to drift away from Christ and go to those other Orthodox Jews who are practicing circumcision and, and using the law. This just gives you the idea of Peter's passion uh, for what he is saying. So if you want to understand and get a real sense of Peter's passion for this, in regard to how determined he is that God's people do not fall to error or going back to the old ways, I think this is where it might have come from. He knew how wrong it was to retreat back to the old ways, that it dishonoured Christ. And so Peter passes this on again. And he says, don't let them persuade you with clever talk. Rather, be ready to stand firm. Verse uh, 17 to 18. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. As we draw this month's sermons to a close, I just want to recap on these highlights, as it were, what we've learned here. What we started with in this series was understanding that we must be based in the word of God first and foremost. We have this to stop us from being deceived by any other thing calling itself the gospel. And so Peter starts out with that and says, look at the scripture Look at the eyewitnesses. It is true what God is going to do. Trust in what he has said already. He says everything in scripture is reliable, including the eyewitness accounts, uh, both of the past of the prophets and of the apostles. He says all of it is reliable. But then he says it's more than just knowing stuff. It's more than just knowing scripture than even memorizing it. We have to allow it to impact our very lives. The combination of studying God's word and have it soak into our heart is so that we do not once again become entangled in what we've escaped from. As Peter warns us, we will be worse off and be better to have not known the way of righteousness to begin with. So Peter then tells us, be on your guard. Because these people will try to carry us away through their lawlessness and false teaching. Uh, 2, Peter, sorry, 2 Timothy 4, 2 to 4 says, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience careful uh, and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not part with sound doctrine, Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. The church, as its foundational outworking of the gospel, is the word of God, Jesus Christ. Without this, there is no other foundation on which the outworking of the gospel is based on. Ephesians 4, 11 to 15 says, It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. The correct handling and teaching of God's word and its sharing is the primary purpose for the existence of the church and therefore any organization calling itself Christian. It has to be rooted in the word 
and any mission it does must come from the word. We cannot hide behind schemes and other things and tack on some Bible at the end. We must be ready to submit to the truth that God's word is sufficient for us to live by. As Peter says, clever schemes, divisive stories, fabricated stories. Those things are not the church. Those things are not the purpose of the church. It is the word of God. God's word is sufficient for us to live by. It is not man-made ideas that dilute the gospel or worse still, change it. And so I'm going to finish on this verse back to 2 Timothy 3. Uh, 14 to 17 but as for you continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of because you know that those who from whom you learned it uh, and how from infancy you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking correcting training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work as with all sermons all series or whatever we want to call them we come back to this main point if we are not basing the existence of our churches on the word of god there is no point us being here we are just giving lip service to something that doesn't really exist it doesn't really exist if in our hearts we don't believe in Jesus, if we don't trust that the word of God can change people. Not clever schemes, not clever things that man come up with, but the word of God itself. If we are here for that, there is a purpose for this church and any other church that wants to put its faith and trust in the word of God. And I pray that we will most certainly continue to do that that sometimes it can be so difficult to see this world and go around it and this community and hear people say, why don't more people come? Sometimes people don't want to hear the truth. Sometimes people don't want to accept what's reality. We have this time right now, as I say, refer back to the election, where what is truth? I would say the fundamental point now is that when you get moments like this, when you start having people navigate the truth, shall we call it, that we have to stand firm in the word, that we're going to be servants of Christ, that when this time comes, when people come, when we have opportunity, do you know what they want that they don't know they want? They want truth. They want the reality of the situation. And I hear this, I've heard this all the time. People say, why don't they just tell it how it is? Do you know that Christians told it how it was? Do you know what happened to them? They were persecuted for it. This is not some happy, nice feeling thing that we're going to have to convey to people. It is the truth of the gospel which will sting and it will hurt. And I know that only by my own experience that it stings and it hurts when you come to the realization that you are not enough. That you've sinned against the Holy God and you're in need of redemption. But as I said to someone here, that's the lowest you can go. Once you realize that there's nowhere to go, once the bottom has been hit, the only way is up. Once you realize that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, the only way is up. This is the message we must give to people in order that they know the truth of the gospel so that they may be saved. Let's not worry about numbers. Let's not worry about how many people we get to whatever event, as good as that may be. Let's make sure that people know Jesus. Let's make sure that people know who he is so they have the chance to choose him over this broken world. Let's pray and then we'll worship together.